see you this evening. Thankful for the opportunity to be here. Thank uh, Brother Keith and Vern and Mike for the opportunity to speak at this gospel meeting. And I've decided to talk about staying focused on Jesus from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. And this evening I want us to use the text which was just read. Matthew chapter 1 picking up at the verse 18. I did want to say thank you so much to Mike and Karen Smith for keeping us this week. It is always a pleasure to be with them. Uh, they're like family to Sherry and I, and we just appreciate them uh, so much. I think my children believe that we are uh, blood-related uh, to the Smiths. They've just meant so much to my family through the years, and I'm thankful for them and thankful to be staying with them. We enjoy that so much. This evening we're talking about the birth of Jesus. Then we see in verses 18 and 19 of Matthew chapter 1 that Jesus came into this world with a troublesome start. We're told in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18 that Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Now that is not something that we have in our culture today. There are some similarities between that and in being engaged, but it's not the same thing. A Jewish patrol was as binding as marriage and could not be broken except by a decree of divorce. So Mary and Joseph have been pledged to each other by a covenant, but not yet formally married. And Mary is found with child. Now imagine being Joseph in this situation. There is only one natural conclusion to draw from this circumstance if you're Joseph. And I said natural circumstance. Mary has clearly been unfaithful to him. Now I want you to think about Joseph's situation. Try to understand that in the society in which he lived. He basically had two choices. Number one, he could choose to stay with Mary despite her perceived infidelity. Or he could divorce her. The problem with the first choice for Joseph is that society was going to assume that he had sinned. If he stays with Mary, then they would assume that he is the father of this child and therefore that they committed sin by being together before they were married. And we're told in verse 19 it brings the point out that Joseph is a righteous man. His reputation is on the line. And the only other option is to divorce Mary for her infidelity. And I think we can see in verse 19 that that is what he's thinking. I think it's interesting that in Scripture, this Joseph, He's never quoted, never quote unquote what he has said, a statement that he has made. Yet often, and we will talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus, Lord willing, tomorrow evening, she is quoted often. But Joseph, we are allowed to see what he was thinking. And Joseph is wrestling with what to do. Because this is a serious situation under Jewish law. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 22 and see verses 13 through 24, that if your wife was found not to be a virgin at marriage, then she was to be stoned by the city for this outrageous thing that had been done. So all that Joseph had to do was to take 
Mary to the elders of the city to lay the charge of sexual immorality on her and let the elders judge her. Joseph had the right by the law to put Mary to public shame. But again, Joseph is a righteous man and he has resolved, we see, to divorce Mary for her infidelity. I believe that's what we can see that he is thinking. However, he does not want to put Mary to a public shame. He is going to, in his mind, do it quietly, in secret. Joseph could have publicly condemned her. She could have been put on display for her, her unfaithfulness under the law. But he is a righteous man, and he does not want to do that. He does not choose to publicly disgrace her. How oftentimes married people decide to publicly shame their spouse over things far less than this. How many times do we try to disgrace others for what we perceive that they have done to us? I want us to see the righteousness of Joseph in this situation. At this moment, he believes that he has been deeply wrong, yet he is still thinking about Mary. He is putting the interest of her ahead of his own interest. He is returning good upon one that he thinks has done this evil against him. It is in a moment where Joseph's faith and righteousness is being tested. Now you see, God has not told Joseph everything that was going on at this point. God had not revealed that to him. God could have chosen to immediately have told him, but God did not do this. Instead, he allows Joseph to consider his options and to think about what he's going to do. And once Joseph has come to his decision, now is when God is going to intervene with Joseph. And as Joseph has decided to put Mary away quietly, in secret, for her unfaithfulness, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. And that angel has a message. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife because this child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. God now intervened so that his plan will be accomplished. But have you thought about why it all happened this way? Why can't we have a repeat of Abraham and Sarah for a miraculous birth? Why can't we have a repeat of Zechariah and Elizabeth for a miraculous birth? Why the virgin birth? And why are we told twice in this text that the conception is from the Holy Spirit? I believe we need to go to Isaiah chapter 7 that records the prophecy. And it's important to see God's message regarding the child that is to be born. In Isaiah chapter 7 that is quoted here in Matthew chapter 1, we read about a king named Ahaz. He rules over the nation of Judah. And there is a problem, you see, that he has two nations, Syria and Israel, have joined forces and they are going to attack his nation, Judah. The whole nation is afraid as the armies have come up for war at the city of Jerusalem. And the Lord sends Isaiah to give King Ahaz a message. And the message is very simple. Do not be afraid of these two nations. I'm not going to allow their plans to stand. These nations are going to be turned away. 
And then the message from the Lord to Ahaz is to ask for a sign to prove that this is going to happen as confirmation. And even though it appears to be against all odds, God wants this king of Judah, Ahaz, to ask for a sign from God. Ahaz refuses under the guise of piety. He has no interest in listening to the Lord or seeking the Lord. But the Lord says that he will give a sign anyway. And this is where that quotation in Matthew chapter 1 about a virgin bearing a son whose name will be Emmanuel comes in. And the point of this sign of the virgin birth, according to Isaiah chapter 7, is to show that God still rules and that he is going to deliver his people. Just as God sent Moses and Samuel to be deliverers, and just as he brought about Samson through a miraculous birth, God is going to send a Savior. So now Jesus is declared to be the ultimate Savior that God is going to send. You see, this time, this Savior is not just going to save God's people, his people from the Egyptians like Moses did. This time, the Savior is not just going to deliver God's people from the Philistines like Samson did. The Savior, this one, is not just going to merely rescue his people from other nations like Syria or Assyria, Babylon. That's too small of a work for this Savior that's being prophesied in Isaiah 7. This Savior is going to save the world from two of the worst enemies, and that is sin and death, spiritual death. The virgin birth has been given as a sign to declare what Jesus is coming to do. Why he would leave the riches of heaven and come to this earth in poverty so that we through his poverty might become rich to be our Savior. So the virgin birth signifies victory over all enemies of God and his people. Look there in Matthew chapter 1, the last two verses, 24 and 25. Then Joseph, this is after he received the message, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. So Joseph awakens from his dream and he does exactly what the angel of the Lord commanded him. Joseph did not divorce Mary like he had been thinking before he received the message. But instead, he marries her. Joseph obeys the command from God despite the scandal that would be carried about from this. Mary is going to have a child, even though Joseph will not be physically intimate with her until after she has given birth. There is not going to be any mistake about it. It is going to be a virgin birth. And in Matthew 1 and verse 16, it makes it clear to us that Joseph is not the father. Joseph is the husband of Mary of whom Jesus was born. And it is a scandalous beginning to the story of Jesus' birth, which is even alluded to later in the ministry of Jesus 
in John chapter 8 and verse 41. In John chapter 8 and verse 41, the Jews said to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. That is a direct slur against Mary and Jesus. We were not born of fornication. God desires to live with his people. And we should see this in the birth of Jesus. The world was not worthy of this ultimate Savior. The world is worthy of judgment and death. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6 and verse 23. Yet God sent his son to save us. We do not deserve it. In fact, we deserve public disgrace for all the sins that we've committed. Our unfaithfulness to God. We deserve death. We deserve to have any kind of relationship with the Lord in when we live life of sin. But yet God, we see, does not want to put us to an open shame. He wants to be reconciled with us. He desires for us to be with him in heaven. So much so, he loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son to save us from eternal death. God loves us so much and so desires to be with us that he does not put us away for our infidelity, for our unfaithfulness. Instead, if we obey him, he forgives us and he takes us. He accepts us. God is going to wash us and cleanse us so that we can be presented to him in splendor, according to Ephesians 5, verses 26 and 27, without spot or blemish. We experience a new life. When Jesus was teaching Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he talks about being born again. In Romans chapter 6, Paul is writing a letter to the Roman Christians, and he talks about being baptized into Christ in the likeness of his death, burial, resurrection, things we're going to be talking about later this week, Lord willing. And he talks about being a new creature. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, being a new creature created for good works. Paul talks about in writing to the church at Ephesus. We experience a new life New hope because God sent his son. Emmanuel means God with us. Do we grasp what that means? God with us. God came to this earth, the son of God. You know, back in 1969, I remember one evening, my whole family was gathered at my grandmother's house around her television, big console TV, black and white, you remember? It just had a few channels it could pick up. But we were all gathered around. I didn't really understand at the age I was what was going on, but I knew it was something special that we were there to watch. And it was man landing on the moon. And I remember the statement from Armstrong. This is one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. That's a very famous quote. I'm sure we've all heard it many times. But did you realize later there was another astronaut? James Irwin. 
Not as many people heard of him. But he made a statement I think that is much better than the one I just gave you. He said there's something more significant than man walking on the moon. And that is God walking on the earth. Jesus came here to save us. And a lot of times we think about the suffering of Jesus and what he went through to save us and we start thinking about the cross. That is not where his suffering started. I believe his suffering started when he came to this earth. He left heaven, the place I'm sure we all desire to go. Let us look unto him. Let us have a relationship with him. Regardless of what we go through in this life, and it can be so difficult. I know many of you have, are suffering right now. And I don't even know half of what you've gone through. But don't give up on the Lord. This past Thursday night, I was with a man as his wife passed away. You know what he found comfort in at that time? And he was heartbroken. The relationship she had with the Lord. And we prayed together, cried together. But she lived her life with hope. And that's what will help him through this time. Don't give up on God. Job, you think about all he lost. And he, like Joseph, Joseph at first didn't know the circumstances of his being tested. Abraham in Genesis 22 didn't understand the circumstances of his being tested. Job didn't understand the circumstances of him, him being tested. He lost ten children, seven sons, three daughters in one day. Can you imagine? Ten funerals in one day. He lost servants. He lost so much that he had acquired. But he had a remarkable attitude. He didn't give up on God. If anyone tied a knot in the rope of faith and hung on for dear life, it was Job. Satan allowed him to keep his wife and her advice was curse God and die. I'm thankful he didn't listen to her. His friends, trying to figure out what he, what he did wrong. I think the, the best thing that his friends did for them was before they opened their mouth and started speaking. But Job kept the faith and God rewarded him for that. So regardless of what you're going through, think about the reason Jesus came here to save you and take it personal. He came to save you. He died for you. He took your sins to the cross. We owe him our very life. And he extends the invitation to you this evening. In Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you're not a child of God, put away that old person. Be baptized, become a new creature in Christ, having your sins washed away. Repent of your sins, confess you believe Jesus is the Son of God. 
Not the son of Joseph, but the son of God. The Holy Spirit conceived with Mary and brought forth Emmanuel, God with us. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Live faithful unto death. And God will, will reward you. If you need to come forward, please come while together we stand and sing. Amen.